And welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Danny Cannell. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Bud Elliott. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you with more win totals. We already hit the Pac-12 with the North and the South. We already hit half of the Big 12, and now it is time to turn our attention to the rest of the Big 12. Uh, the order of operations for today is we're going to hit the four Texas schools that would be Texas, Baylor, TCU, Texas Tech, and West Virginia to round it out. Uh, we've got in this group uh, the Big 12, the odds on not the odds on favorite, but the fa betting favorite to win the Big 12 in the Texas Longhorns. We've got the reigning Big 12 champions in the Baylor Bears. Um, I, I just got, should we just dive right in? I mean, we don't need to hit, hit any big breakdown. We've got picks and people want them. So we'll go ahead and get this thing started with the musical stylings of the general manager of Vanderbilt football. As much as I think it's the, the under Down is a up. safe play, like I can't even. Down on I can't fathom who wins. How many kids are gonna win this fall? I just can't. I don't see it. It's not, it's not on there. It's not, not the schedule I'm looking at. Unless there's another schedule somewhere. So we begin our breakdown with the rest of the Big 12 with the Texas Longhorns. Um, this is a, a number sitting currently, as we've pulled it for the Caesar Sportsbook for this episode, at a round nine wins. Uh, I've got it over at plus 105, under at minus 135. And that seems uh, especially notable. I, I mentioned in the previous show that my first pull of win totals was maybe a couple weeks ago. Texas, nine and a half. So this number is dropping. Um, you know, we haven't had any games. We haven't had any major news that's been breaking. So again, Texas currently sitting at nine, even juice to the under that was as high as nine and a half a couple of weeks ago. The non-conference includes one of the biggest non-conference games that we're going to have the entire season. Steve Sarkeesian going up against his old boss, Alabama, coming to Austin. The rest of the non-conference schedule includes ULM and UTSA, all three of those games, again, in Daryl K. Royal Stadium. Uh, when you take a look at the breakdown of the conference schedule, they have to go on the road to Oklahoma State. They have to go on the road to Kansas State at Texas Tech. Of course, Oklahoma is a neutral. Home games include Baylor, TCU, Iowa State, and West Virginia. We've got Quinn Ewers. Their Hudson card is still there. Bijan Robinson's you know, potentially one of the best running backs in all of football. They did a great job through the transfer portal, but we have to stop applying recruiting buzz. We have to stop applying Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning, because guess what? He ain't on the roster right now. So as we're looking at this round number of nine, a season of expectations of competing for a Big 12 title, what do we think is in store for the Longhorns in year two with Steve Sarkeesian? Under, it's Texas. Do I have to say more than that? Honestly, I mean, it's uh. Yeah, I mean, give it, give me the losses because right. yeah, this. Well, is, I think that this is. They're, not they're definitely zero. starting one and one at best. Okay. Like, not I beating mean, Alabama. Yeah, like what's the and also at shot? worst because they're not losing Louisiana Monroe. Yeah, I don't think so, so. They've got one loss right off the bat there before they get out of the non-con. I don't. I know UTSA was scary last year, and I still think they're going to be good in Conference USA, but I don't think they're going to be quite as good because they lose Frank Harris, they lose Sincere McCormick, their offensive coordinator is gone. So we don't have a 100% idea of what UTSA is going to look like. So I, I feel safe saying Texas is going to win that game. In conference, Oklahoma, that's right now, that I lean more still towards Oklahoma. We went over that in the first part of the Big 12. I think the Sooners are the better team in the Big 12. Oh, at Oklahoma State, that could be a problem. At Kansas State, that could be a problem. Home games against Iowa State and Baylor could be problems. I just, I think this team is going to be good. I don't think it's going to be as bad defensively as it was last year. I expect improvement. It's just that defense was so bad last year that even with improvement, that doesn't mean they're going to be going nine and three or ten and two. And to take the over here, you have to be saying Texas is going to go ten and two. What do you think is more likely? The Texas Longhorns, the program we've seen year in and year out fail to live up to expectations going eight and four or going ten and two. I'm leaning eight and four is more likely than 10 to two. The total is at nine. I would say the push is far more likely than the 10. And I'd say the eight is slightly more likely than the nine. So what is the best case scenario for Texas? And how close is the best case scenario to the over, right? Like in what world do they hit the over on this, but not reach their best case scenario? 
It has to do with the rest of the Big 12. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. The best case scenario is that Baylor is a slight step back, that Oklahoma State is a slight step back, that Oklahoma is operating right at that 9-10 win mark. It is much more of a, like, how, not how good do you think Texas is going to be to the best version of Texas, but what is the potential that the rest of the Big 12 is a big muddled mess? Because there is, I think, enough high-end talent and the potential of offensive firepower you know, Xavier Worthy coming into his own, Isaiah Neor coming in. Like the passing attack with Quinn Ewers could be awesome. Could be one of the most fun offenses with Bijan Robinson as well in the entire country. I agree that there's a hundred percent reason to be concerned about the defense, but if you it, you've got to be bullish on some of these other teams in the Big 12 to think that uh to think that Texas is for sure not gonna be able to be on top of them. I, I am. Um, so I'm going under on, on Texas. I I could see Quinn Ewers being a total stud this year, right? I could see the offensive line being passable. Oh, I think it's going to be very, very good next year. But I could also, and I think the receivers will will be total studs, right? I mean, you you, you get worthy, you get as an error. Those are are really good guys. I could see the defensive line taking a decent step forward, but both the lines of scrimmage, uh, I think the depth on those is is poor in terms of guys who are ready to step up behind them because they have recruited well, but they're young. You know, and what are the odds Texas stays really healthy along the lines of scrimmage? And they're going to need to in order to hit this this over, I believe, because they also you know, they they did lose quite a bit in that secondary, and that that is also a concern of mine. I I think I just don't see it with this number. I'm at like eight point two, mm-hmm. and so for me that that's a uh, that's an under without really a whole lot of thought. I think nine and a half was absolutely. Ins- I mean, that was a great get if you got if you got any of that. I, I did not. I wish I could have. That'd be awesome. But under all day long yeah, on the Longhorns. Yeah. I'm sorry. You just have to. I it, the quarterbacks are all potential. I mean, we we realize that, right? Like we haven't <laughs> seen either one do much, whether it's Hudson Card or we haven't seen Quinn Ewers do anything. I think it was really important. I think Bud pointed out the other day he had he skipped his senior year of development in high school. Like he hasn't played football in a long time. And the last time he played was at a much different level than what he's gonna face. I just think this is, and if they surprise you the upside, you tip your cap and you say, well done, Sark. And Sark's big talking point at Big 12 Media Days, or at least Texas, their big talking point was, well, Sark coached with Nick Saban and he coached with Pete Carroll and both those coaches in their first year were, you know, six win teams. Well, this is going to be a massive jump forward in their second year. We saw double digit wins and I get that line of thinking, but you guys all said it, it's Texas perennially disappoint to the downside until they prove us otherwise. And I think nine and three is a great season. Yeah. That's probably the best scenario that you have. And Tom, I would disagree with you on the UTSA coming to town, like feeling sorry for yourself after Alabama, whatever the score is in that game, or if it's a close game and you lose and you're battered up and beaten down, I think Jeff trailer is going to have that super bowl mentality of we could catch them they better be careful because i think they could start off one and two and then it's all right you want to talk about culture like are we going to get another player with a phone on a bus taping bo davis going off on his players i don't know how the culture of that program is yet so i think you have to take the under all day long on the longhorns and by the way, I made all that argument for the sake of content. I'm on the under as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to at least like present the other side of this um, because I the spot in the schedule situationally where it could get really dicey, in my opinion, is when you've got at Oklahoma State, at Kansas State, back to back. If there's any injuries that are exposing the depth issues, if there's any um, up and down that you've got, if they are not rock solid going into both of those games where beating those teams in their home stadiums is very, very difficult then Texas uh, is going to end up catching a a second and a third, if not a third and a fourth loss on that schedule. Again, I've got Alabama as well on there. And then like maybe, maybe this thing, whether it's a push or a, uh, a win on the under comes down to the Baylor game. Last game of the regular season, Baylor's coming to Austin. I could absolutely see that being a, it's not going to get you to 10. It's either going to get you to nine or it's either going to have you settling at eight yeah, yeah this is a team that last year it finished like 95th nationally in success rate on defense it finished 90 98th 
in points per drive allowed, and it finished 113th in pressure rate on opposing quarterbacks. Like, how many teams do you see win t- 10 games in a season without at least an average defense? Tom, you say it, you say it like it's a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I just, I just don't see that deep. Like, I think they're going to improve, but I don't see them making the kind of improvement they need in one off season to suddenly become a 10 win team. But pole assassin, we need some kind of Halloween magic to be able to get this team focused for the November. Count them up. We turn our attention to the reigning Big 12 champion, Baylor Bears. Baylor's got a round number of eight at the Caesar Sportsbook with the price split evenly, minus 115 to either side. Uh, you take a look at the schedule. The non-conference includes Albany at home, a road trip to BYU. Is that Las Vegas or is that at true at BYU? I believe it's in Provo from what Ooh, I'm seeing. Tricky, tricky. Um Texas State also rounding out the non-con. When you take a look at the home schedule, they've got Oklahoma State, Kansas, Kansas State, and TCU. They are catch. They do have to go to Iowa State, to West Virginia, to Texas Tech, Oklahoma, and I mentioned that regular season finale against Texas. So, Bud, this is one of your four home games, five away games, uh, over under of eight. What are we doing with Baylor uh, after this? Uh, after a great season for Dave Aranda in 2021. I, I'm, I'm going to go under just because I feel like I, I, this is not one that I'm rushing to bet. By the way, like I, it, you will not see a Baylor under at eight on on win on the win totals lock show for me. Spoiler, uh, but this is kind of a neutral total within the market. I mean, there's a couple seven and a half. There's some eight and a half out there. So this is kind of the the market middle. So we we get a good judge on where we think of, of this, you know, as a team. Um, I thought Baylor last year was a top twenty ish type team um if you back out the bowl game of your power ratings when matt corral you know snapped his leg pretty early on uh, they definitely don't look like a top you know 15 team to me last year they did a lot of a lot of little things very well which i think comes from being a very veteran team and i thought they had a nice veteran defense last year but they do lose a a ton of important players particularly in the back seven though and Mm -hmm. I, i think they'll be very strong up front i mean siake i is really really nice um I also talked to guys on USF staff when they watched, you know, Gary Bohannon, and they were very impressed with Blake Shapin. Uh because they, they watched all the snaps to see kind of how Baylor used used Bohannon, how they used Shapin. They're like, there's no shame in, in that kid. Like, you know, that, that's a real competition. So uh maybe there's an upside on Shapin that I'm not accounting for in my numbers. I just you lost a lot of important guys. Like how how many broadcasts we watch at Baylor and they're like, hey, Taekwon Thornton, okay. Jalen Petrie, you know, Woods, Barnes, Tejada. Smith, Smith and Ebner. Ebner yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, like a bunch of important guys who are are off this roster, but I think they'll be able to run the football very well with an offensive line. I think Blake Shapin's probably pretty good. I just don't see nine wins here. BYU's tricky. Again, like like Chip said, they do have the five roadies. That's That's tough, man. And none of those roadies are Kansas. So they have five legitimate Big 12 road games. If... If there is a benefit to their five road games, I feel like, I mean, West Virginia on the road is tricky because I feel like that's a game that Baylor probably counts on to win, but adding the road factor to it makes it a little more difficult. But like getting Oklahoma on the road and Texas on the road, it's like those are going to hurt them, I think, in the conference race. But I think when it comes to projecting wins, those are two games where their win expectancy is already kind of lower than most of the other ones. I have this as a push. Like, I, I think this team's going eight and four. Like my projections have that at 8.2 wins, which <laughs> so I'm leaning towards the over because of that. But I just, you, you went over a lot of it. They, they lose a lot on defense. I think a Dave Aranda team is probably still going to be pretty solid defensively. They'll find guys, they'll figure it out. The scheme's going to be strong enough offensively. I worry that they're losing some stuff, but I also think that we are going to see a legit upgrade at the quarterback position so maybe that helps balance some of it out it's just i don't think i think this team kind of had its best case scenario last year as far as results and as far as what it can do and i expect it to come back down to earth but not crash down so i think eight and four is most likely i'm leaning over but it's going to be eight and four uh i'm same with tom i'm going on the over when i went through the losses potential losses I had a couple of those. Like at BYU is a tricky one because I have that as a potential yeah. loss. But who do you trust more in this situation? I don't know. Like I, have I think BYU it's more favored. A, what's that? 
I have BYU as a favorite. And I think they'll, but it'll be tight line. It might be think? already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Same That's with Jeff, oh, Jeff Grimes. Does Jeff Grimes is Jeff Grimes too far removed to have any insider roster information, or does BYU have the insight on what Grimes wants to do? <laughs> right. I think three years is uh, a little bit, or two two years, I guess, is a little bit too much to take that into consideration. But in any case, like I looked at the losses and I came up with four losses, but I weren't like they were lock losses. And then there were a couple wins where it was like, yeah, I think they'll win, but they weren't lock wins. But I. I feel like I trust Dave Aranda on the defense, much like Tom said. I think they're going to get an upgrade, and they're going to have a pretty physical run game up front. I think that works. I think it works in the Big 12. So I'm on the over here, but not with a ton of confidence. I'm on the over. Uh, I think that this is the best team along the line of scrimmage in the Big 12 on both sides, offensive line, defensive line. I Fair. think excellent. And I, that is going to be um, – that's going to be an advantage that I'm going to be able to rely on when it comes to winning some of these coin flip type games. So yeah, eight, eight and four seems likely, but I think nine and three is far more likely than seven and five. There's just been such an impressive uh, floor raising that was done just from year one to year two. And I think that the inexperience at wide receiver is not something that I'm concerned about because I've, I wasn't even excited about the skill players as much last year going into Baylor. You were just like, Oh, well, they're really productive. They, you know, they've got the um, does doesn't Baylor still do the the sort of like height, weight, speed? Doesn't matter what you played in high school. This is what we think you are. You're going to go and be a wide receiver. I, I think that they're going to be able to have uh, enough uh, enough players that are going to be able to step up in that situation. So I, I am on the over. How many games are going to win this fall? Turning our attention to the TCU Horned Frogs. It is Sonny Dykes coming and taking over, and he inherits uh, two good quarterbacks in Max Duggan and Chandler Morris. He's got one of the most explosive wide receivers in the conference in Quentin Johnston, and it's going to be interesting to see you know, how this TCU team looks. There were you know, Gary Patterson was matching himself with air raid offensive coordinators and you know trying to make it work. The defense really fell off. Well, now it's, I mean, Sonny Dykes is going to have total control of the identity of this Horn Frogs team. You take a look at the schedule. They start at Colorado. Uh, they also have, a, hold on, is it the skillet? The iron skillet. The iron, iron skillet, skillet yeah. against uh, SMU, which should be awesome for all the Sonny Dykes factors there. That game uh, is on the road, you know, road. Uh, Tarleton State is also the rest of the non-con. For the Big 12 conference schedule, Oklahoma's at home. Oklahoma State's at home. Kansas State's at home. Texas Tech's at home. Iowa State's at home. They're on the road at Kansas, at West Virginia, at Texas, and at Baylor. Tom, what are we doing with uh, TCU and their six-and-a-half win total, minus 140 to the over, plus 110 to the under? You know, I'm, I'm wearing my Arizona shirt today, my home field shirt for I, I got a TCU one a couple weeks ago. It's part of their big new Saturday this season. Uh, I'm not wearing the TCU shirt today, though, because under, and I'm fairly confident about it. I just, I'm not very high on the Horn Frogs in year one under Sonny Dykes. I think that when you've had Gary, when you had a coach in charge for as long as you had Gary Patterson in charge, I do think the adjustment probably takes a little longer than if it's a guy who was there for three to four years and you're just cycling through. And I think that there's got to be a lot of people in that building getting used to new roles. I look at the schedule and two of their three non-conference games are on the road. Like, I think they're going to beat Colorado in the opener, but that's not a given being on the road and then going to SMU, considering all the Sonny Dykes kind of stuff that's going on with just the, the rivalry there and just how fired up SMU is going to be at home for that game. I, I lean towards SMU in that game. So I look at the schedule and I think they're starting two and two at best because they open big 12 with Oklahoma and you get in the conference. Like I think they'll win at Kansas, Oklahoma state at home, coin flip, Kansas state at home, coin flip at West Virginia on the road, coin flip, Texas tap, slightly TCU, but not that far off of a coin flip at Texas, Texas at Baylor, Baylor, Iowa State at home, coin flip. There are way too many coin flips here for me to sit there and look at this win total sitting at six and a half and think, oh yeah, this team's definitely going seven and five, especially with that non-con. So I'm under. I'm yeah. over. I'm over. I think this is a program that and this is not a knock against Gary Patterson. I think this happens to a lot of programs when you have a coach that's there that long. It just gets a little stale, right? It, and it felt like 
it was time and it needed a little infusion of life. And I think that Sonny Dykes will bring that. I think there's going to be a freshness about this program. I think they'll figure out the quarterback because Sonny Dykes offensive guy. I don't know if it's Max Duggan. I probably would lean towards Chandler Morris being the better guy in his system. I think the defense will be better. You mentioned those games. They did lose the, what is it? The battle for the iron skillet. Mm -hmm. They did lose that game last year, but I think they'll come out on top of that one. I think they start off three and zero, so I got I got them off to a strong start, which of course kickstarts there. And then the road games I think are very winnable uh, within the conference, especially getting Kansas there. And I think Iowa State will do theirs in a little bit. I think they get that one, but I have them at seven and five, so I had them over, not uh, not a ton over, but I had them at over. Yeah, I have them at seven point three, so I, I guess I'm the high man on. Well, we got to see what Chip says. I, I I bet this team to win the conference. At twenty-eight to one, when when Caesars hung that out there, uh, I feel like there's a lot of uncertainty in the Big Twelve this year, and there has to be some value created from the ridiculousness of listing Texas as the favorite. Like Texas can win the conference in theory, but also like should they be the favorite? I disagree with that. Uh, so I, I think there's some value on TCU. They are the prime example, I think, of the only playing four conference road games, one of which is at Kansas. Um, you know, I I like. I mean, they can they can lose Oklahoma. Okay. Your other ones at West Virginia, that's not an easy game, but it's it, they'll still be favored, I think, against the Mountaineers. Uh, at Texas, we'll have to see what Texas is. At Baylor, that's also tough. But I do think they're going to beat Colorado. I think they'll beat Tarleton State. And I, I think they're going to go five and three in conference. So to me, it's can you get two more wins in the non-conference? And I, I, I believe they can. So I, I, I like this one. I like the 28 to one better. Uh, yes, because I think there's like some upside potential here, like some real upside potential. Quentin Johnson's a beast. You know, they they return a lot in the back seven in terms of, you know, the, when you count in the transfers they got. I know the, the kid they got from Louisiana Monroe, um, uh, the safety Newton is, is a player a lot of schools liked. So I'm, I'm on the over. I'm on the over as well. Um, I I wanted to come in at, and not that I wanted to take the under, but the book on Sonny Dykes uh, from the experience that we've had with him as a head coach, uh, at least my notes say you know, when, uh, when they had more talent or when they were able to overmatch uh, an opponent, it was going to be a win. Well, every time that SMU bumped its head against one of the better teams in the American athletic conference, they, they weren't able to get it done. Uh, same thing with Cal when, they were able to go up against a defense that wasn't able to have any answers. Then they were able to win enough games to get to a bowl. I just think that this is such a favorable non-conference schedule, and I think this is such a favorable conference split that TCU ends up making it to 7-5. and five. I just don't think that there's enough defenses that I look at and think, okay, that is going to be the defense that's going to be able to slow this offense down. And so with the the overall state of some of these defenses in the Big 12, I just don't think that there's uh, quite enough for me to be able to say that TCU is not going to be able to get to seven and five. Now, if this number were seven and a half, then I'd be going under because I think that there's just enough of resistance that TCU is going to face that could expose some of that same Sonny Dykes uh, approach where against the best teams they can't get it done then they beat up on the bad teams but as this sits right now I do think that seven and five is is very much in the range uh, so I will be going over as well okay so as there, as the podcast's resident TCU hater now for this year I, I'd like to ask the three of you a question do you expect that a team going from the head coach of Gary Patterson to the head coach of Sonny Dykes is going to improve defensively yes I do not think that those guys wanted to play for Gary Patterson last year because this team last year they defensively they were outside of the top 100 in like awful. multiple key uh, multiple key statistics. Awful, yeah, and I just I agree with you, but because as soon as you brought up the 28 to one for them to win the Big 12 at Caesars, I jumped on that too, and I think that you're right as far as getting the fewer home road games in conference play, including one at Kansas. The problem is when it comes to the win total, they took those fewer road games in the Big 12 and then added right. two more road games in their non-conference schedule. So it's like uh, they could have really taken advantage. If they played all three of their non-con games at home, I think this is a very easy over. But again, I Chip, you said this is a manage easy, manageable non-con. I disagree. Road trips to Colorado and SMU are not going to be easy. But that's not a road trip. I, I would bet. But it's a rivalry yeah. game against the team that wants your head on a pike. I mean, that's a small Bryson DeChambeau school. 
<laughs> you know, you can fill that up with purple. You can you can get some uh you can get you some TCU fans in the door. They don't they don't, they don't have enough right there. Like I, 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 it's it's neutral ish in my analysis. I'm just saying I, I'm really looking forward to the atmosphere at that game. I just that crowd is going to be just because well, there's a lot of hate. Yes. In that rivalry. Yes. Oh, well, and even more now. Yeah. How are you guys projecting quarterback? Because, like, to me, I took it and I said, okay, the chance that they have bad quarterback play is low, given that they have um, Dug it two in kids. Yeah. Right. Like, two kids. I have a decent feeling that Sonny Dykes will will get one of them right. Also, they've been running not the exact same thing, but Patterson did try Similar. to go to some of this. Yeah. And, like, he didn't. they didn't do it super well. But at least I think some of the concepts will be uh, at least not totally foreign. So you might have a jump start in year one. When oftentimes air raid type coaches take uh, take a little while to get going. Watching TCU with my eyes last year, that was disgusting, and they still finished five and seven. And so we just need to like try a little bit harder on defense, and you know, be able to still have some production offensively where you've got some really good tools. Asking for only a two win improvement on last season, I I think is manageable. So I'll, I'll take that over as well. How many games are going to win this fall? That brings us to West Virginia. Uh, West Virginia. By the way, uh, TCU is up to six and a half. They were at six a couple weeks ago. West Virginia also moving up. They are up to five and a half. They were at five a couple weeks ago. Uh, five and a half. The price at Caesar Sportsbook is split minus 115 to either side. Of course, we do have JT Daniels. And then there was this very concerning quote from Neil Brown at Big 12 Media Days. It's like, what's the most important thing you know, for the team this year? Most important thing for the offense? I didn't hear the question. But his response was, well, we need to keep, we need to keep JT healthy. You're like, oh, oh we're concerned? We're, we're concerned about JT Daniels' health right now? So I hope for JT Daniels' sake that he is able to be healthy, play 12 regular season games, but absolutely a concern. Uh, defensively, you know, Dante Stills is one of the best uh, NFL prospects, one of the best defensive linemen in the entire conference. Now, offensively, you bring back a lot on the offensive line. Are, will producer Coca be enjoying a cheese it bowl appearance with the six and six West Virginia Mountaineers? Are the Mountaineers going over this five and a half total? Does Coca enjoy anything? <laughs> He he enjoys his he enjoys his time here with the Cover Three podcast, <laughs> but uh, not as much time as his time with David Sampson. So, yeah. <laughs> but it's like, not personal. That's right. All right. I, we were talking about like we were just talking about TCU's non-con. Like I I don't want to criticize this because I'm thrilled it's back because West Virginia is opening the season at oh, Pitt. They, right. And the backyard brawl being back is fantastic because I've missed it since conference realignment the first time kind of tore it apart. That's great. But then you've also got at Virginia Tech in the same schedule. It's like you're playing two of your three non-con games on the road against ACC schools like Towson at home. You should have another like group of five. Give me home game if you're going to be playing Pitt on the road to open the season. But they didn't do that. And so you look at their schedule. Three of their first five games are on the road. Pitt. Virginia Tech and Texas, and they'll win the two home games against Kansas and Towson, but they're going to lose all three of those road games. So we're looking at a two and three start. So now we've got to win four of our last seven to get over and get to a bowl game. And you look at the back half of the schedule, Baylor's at home uh, at Texas Tech. That's a winnable game, but it's on the road. Iowa State is a beatable team, but that's on the road. Oklahoma State on the road to finish the year. That's going to be tough. You get home dates against Baylor, TCU, Oklahoma, Kansas State. I just... This team is going to have a hard time getting to a bowl game. So I, I'm leaning towards under. It's not like a home run slam dunk going to lock it up later, but I, I just don't see this team getting to six and six as often as it's at five and seven. So under. I, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I mean, no, I just, why? This is another situation where we've got a coach who potentially is on the hot seat and you're just handing him a brutal start with the non conference that you mentioned, Tom. And some other games early on in the schedule that are going to potentially stack up these losses. And, and we have another, I think Arizona state is one team that we've talked about like this so far in our win total series, where you have to take into consideration that when you get into those November games, the games where 
that winning those coin flips are going to potentially get you over the total. If they've already got six losses on the season, do you imagine that they're going to be able to backs against the wall, circle the wagons, and and go and get you those wins against Oklahoma, Kansas State, and Oklahoma State? Because if the season looks lost, then these things could pile up quick. I'm I'm on the under. I think this could be a four and eight season. Like I I it I don't think it'll be three and nine, but I don't think it'll be six and six. But I think four and eight, five and seven are are very much in the possibility here. Who's the quarterback again? We hope JT Daniels. Even if it is, which we you hope. I don't know if you're going to be hoping for him for long. I'm going under all day long. The schedule's brutal. Uh, and what's the future of Neil Brown look like? You know, like it's – and if it's up in the air and it starts off rough, I mean, we've seen this story before where teams kind of throw in the towel at the back end of the season if they know their coach is gone. I don't know if he's gone or not, but – it doesn't look like the schedule setting up nice, so I'm taking the under all day. I'm with you. I this feels too easy, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Almost, yeah. you know, and and that and that does scare me. And like the numbers moving up, so I, I think it's important that I give a little respect to the market, right? Some people are betting this over, and we do know historically that that teams that are lined at five and a half, like betting under on them as an actual bet, is generally a losing proposition. Teams, as long as their coach is not getting fired, do continue to play hard. To get to a bowl like that's still a thing especially for teams that are you know not trying to play for a national title or something like that which certainly the mountaineers are not but i i'm also going to join you guys on the under um i just don't see it i'm not a not a huge believer in jt daniels i have some concerns about the players that, that the mountaineers lost in the transfer portal winston wright was their go-to receiver last year he's gone to florida state now he you know messed up his leg pretty good in a car crash uh, a couple months ago uh, Akeem Mesador, one of their best defensive players in the defensive line, transferred to Miami. They lost both linebackers who played over 500 snaps, and they also lost Daryl Porter Jr. to the transfer portal. And I know some of the lines, like, he's not that good, but, okay, you guys did give him 710 snaps last year on defense, so if he's not that good, what what's behind him? I, I think they've lost a lot of important talent. It wouldn't shock me. Like, I'm not betting this, I don't think, because I think – it's not crazy to think they could. I mean, we don't know what what the Hokies will be. Oh, that's no, I, fair. Like the pit. It, do you just come in guns blazing it, Thursday? You know, mm-hmm. backyard brawl. Does does West Virginia play its best game of the season? I mean, don't forget, like Virginia Tech beat then top ten North Carolina and then tanked and ended up firing Justin Fuente. We get we get a lot of those weird week one, week two results that don't always match up with the product on the field at the end of the season. Take rivalry into consideration. I've I've given Pitt that win, but I, I don't think it is. I did too. I don't, I don't think it is crazy to imagine that West Virginia is going to end up winning that game. But still under. Yeah, That's even still, if yeah. they do win that game, they could still finish five and seven. Because <laughs> what, what did Virginia Tech finish after beating North Carolina last year? It was uh, they ended up getting plastered by um, Maryland in the bowl game. So I think they yeah, were six and seven. Six and seven. Okay. Yeah. I will say. Uh, the one thing that has really plagued this team in recent years has been poor offensive line play, and it was a, a long-term rebuilding job by Neil Brown. And I think this year they finally have it, right? Like, like this should be one of the better offensive lines in the Big 12. So I'm very interested to see Neil Brown's offense with some functioning pass protection and some people who can open some holes up front. And if they do get to a bowl, that's the path. It's what if, the offensive line gives him protection. And they're able to score points. But what if that's what he meant by keeping JT Daniels healthy? Yeah, that's definitely a problem. Like, <laughs> listen, as long as JT Daniels does not get knocked down, we'll be okay. Yeah, 80 <laughs> times a game. Because right. that was like, who was the kid who was their quarterback last year? I can't remember his name now. Jared Daigie. Uh, Daigie, yeah. yeah. Daigie, Daigie. I mean, he held on to the ball too long, but that kid was getting destroyed the last year. Coming up on the other side, we wrap up the Big 12 with a look at Joey McGuire's Texas Tech Red Raiders. Next. The Joey McGuire bump. Boy, it I mean, it took this it took this team. It was a strange uh mid-season firing for Matt Wells considering that they started the year with a, you know, a win against Houston. They they rolled off a, a couple of victories and then all of a sudden, Joey McGuire gets hired, and they continue to to stack up a 
you know, some good recruiting buzz, but he also took some L's on the field. They did finish in a bowl game, though, thanks to that strong start. Uh, Donovan Smith was certainly very interesting and pr productive here. Is Donovan Smith the quarterback as they also brought in Tyler Shuck as a transfer from Oregon? What is our expectation for the offense? Because they bring in Zach Kitley as offensive coordinator, who you might remember was at Western Kentucky last year with Bailey Zappi. Uh, the Houston Baptist offense is kind of what we're applying here at Texas Tech. It is not going to be hard for college football fans who parachute into the sport in September every year to say, hey, look, look at this Texas Tech team. It's wide open. They're flying around and they're trying to score a whole bunch of points. Will there be enough defense there for them to get victories? The non-conference schedule is tough. They play Houston again. This game will be in Lubbock at home. They play NC State on the road. They also have Murray State as their opener. When they get into conference play, they'll have Texas, West Virginia, Baylor, Kansas, and Oklahoma all coming to Lubbock while they hit the road to go play Kansas State, Oklahoma State, TCU, and Iowa State. The over-under win total at Caesar Sportsbook is a 5 that's another one that's been moving. It was at four and a half a few weeks ago. And currently, it's juiced slightly to the over, minus 120 to the over, minus 110 to the under. Texas Tech, five wins. Is it a push city? Is this an over? Are we going bowling in year one with Joe McGuire? Or do you think that there's not enough wins on the schedule? I think it's push city. Um, I, I If you guys watched the summer school I did, I, I think with Inside the Red Raiders, I thought this was one of the best episodes we did because I had so many questions about this team and I got a lot of answers about it. Uh, legitimately, they don't know who the quarterback's going to be, at least right now. I mean, hell, uh, Morton could even be in the conversation still as, as they enter fall camp, but they, they think they have some good options there. Uh, the schedule is very tough. They have some major losses on the offensive line. Now, they do get some transfers in. We'll have to see you know, how good those guys are actually are Zach Kitley comes into town uh, so they're going to throw the ball all over the place and like Texas Tech played fast last year at times but they didn't always throw the ball a ton this is going to be one of those teams that is throwing the ball a lot so if you're watching this on YouTube okay <laughs> cool watch this on YouTube um I, I man I just look do you think they're better than Houston because I'm, I'm not really sure I do oh. at, at NC State now NC State did play an air raid team last year and played it poorly in Mississippi State. State. Yeah, right. There's a little bit different level of, of athlete, I think. Um, all the road games here are very tough to me. At Kansas State, at Oklahoma State, at TCU, at Iowa State. Like, none of those are games that I think they're going to be favored in. And then you have to – you basically need to get two out of Baylor, Oklahoma, Texas, I think, if you want to make a bowl. But, I mean, I, I've got them at 5.5. Ooh. But I don't think I think it's one of those weird things where I'm just not rushing to bet it. I think six is not that likely. Mm. I got I I think they lose um, every single road game that they've got, and they're not going to beat Baylor and Oklahoma. And they might go into that Oklahoma game at home trying to do upset city play spoiler to whatever the Sooners have going on. But I I think that Oklahoma ends up winning that game. I think they're going five and seven, having to make a pick though. I am uh I will I will go over having to make a pick. I'll go over just with the idea that uh the offense at Western Kentucky was so much fun and so prolific and I I don't know why I'm I'm favoring Donovan Smith here over Tyler Shuck, but if they think that Tyler Shuck's going to be able to get it done, then um, clearly they're going to be the ones who uh are going to have a better idea of what to make it happen. Also interesting to to check here, you know, the Remembering some guys, uh, a lot of guy remembering. How about a uh, coach remembering? Tim DeRoyter is the mm -hmm. defensive coordinator here. Like plus value at his best in terms of being a, a defensive coach. So maybe there's some hope there. Again, I think this is a this is a five and seven. But if I have to make a choice one way or the other, then I think that maybe they end up uh, getting somebody uh, to get to six wins. I'm on the over. I Strong. Am yeah i this is the team that i'm kind of higher on i think obviously than everybody else i just donovan smith tyler shuck based on what i saw last year i'll be surprised if it's not donovan smith because i think that's right. a pretty good quarterback from what i saw and i think that he'd be a good fit in the offense but hey if tyler shuck beats him that probably just means tyler shuck's been playing really well too so i guess it's really not that big of a deal to me in that overall sense but i just i i if 
again, going back to the Smith Shuck thing, this is no offense. So I'm sorry that you're catching strays here, bud. But if Bailey Zappi was able to put up the numbers that he was able to put up in this offense, then whether it's Shuck or Smith, I'm pretty sure whoever's playing quarterback for Texas Tech is going to play well and put up crazy numbers. And this offense is going to score a lot of points. And they're going to show up and face teams and say, listen, you might beat us, but you're going to have to score at least 40 to do it. And some teams will be capable of it. But as we saw in the Big 12 last year, it's not your typical Big 12. It hadn't been last season. And I'm not sure there are as many teams who are capable of showing up and scoring at least 40 points consistently enough to win. I think this team's going bowling. Get out your tortillas, guns up. Let's go, Red Raiders. All right, wow. Tom's talking me into it. Flip pick. I'm, yeah. I'm going to go over. Like I, I guess <laughs> wow. six, is some, six is somewhat more likely than four, yeah. I guess. How about the disparaging remarks to Bailey Zappi, just <laughs> passing him aside like he's a system quarterback who was just drafted in the fourth round by the greatest coach in NFL history, yep. and Bill Belichick. Wow. Mm -hmm. He's had a great history of gonna, drafting I was, lately. <laughs> I, I was almost going to go under because I said Bailey Zappi's not coming with him. I was going to say that. Um, like but it. I'm on the over. I think the Big 12 is going to be a lot of these. I think it's going to be a really entertaining conference. I love Bud's play for TCU because I think it is one of those ones where you could go four or five teams deep. I don't think Texas Tech is one of them. But I do think Joe McGuire inherited a program that's pretty that was headed in the right direction. I mean, they were five and three when they fired Matt Wells. Um, so I think like there's talent on this roster. Talking to some of the guys, my guy Dusty talked to McGuire at Big 12 Media Days, talking to some of their players. They're pretty excited. Um, I'm going to go over too, and enlarge because what Bud flipped his pick for. I don't see this team as a four win team. You know, I, I think six is probably the more likely scenario of those two. Five is probably there, although I I would say out of all these picks, I'd probably feel more confident than some of the other ones we've given out. So I'm going to go with the over um, here for the Red Raiders. Yeah, and also, like, I know that Houston game is tough because I do think Houston's going to be good this year, but I think Texas Tech can win that game pretty well. They did I, last year. That's what I'm saying. I don't think that t Texas Tech is going to be, if it's even an underdog at home against Houston, I don't think it's going to be much more than three or four points. So I just uh, scan in real quick. What do you guys think about this? In the uh, in Tom's approach of Texas Tech shows up, says, all right, you're going to have to be explosive. You're going to have to score 40 to beat us. I think Texas, Oklahoma, TCU, and like they, less than half the conference, I think, is built to really light it up on offense. And instead, it would be more of a situation where um, those teams would hope to be able to stymie them defensively, play some keep away. You know, like the Kansas State approach to beating Texas Tech is going to be to force them into turnovers, force them into three and out, short possessions, then play some ball control. Texas Tech could lose that way, mm -hmm. but if they are able to get it clicking offensively, I do not think the Big 12 is loaded with quarterbacks and passing attacks that are going to be able to go touchdown for touchdown along the way. Is, are there any others other than Texas, Oklahoma, and TCU? No, <laughs> not in my mind. I mean, maybe if some teams take some step forward, but obviously I think Texas Tech is the team that's taking the step forward. Yep. Any final thoughts, bud? No, you look like I, you're either I, thinking or watching the open. I, I just noticed that uh, the cut line at the open shifted from 50 50, uh, one even to 65% even. So I need that. <laughs> in back in time as we're time traveling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, know, the cover three podcast. <laughs> I, you know, I, I just go back to that summer school and, you know, I just, our guest just is like, I'm not super confident they make a bowl. You know, like this schedule is really tough. They're going to have some growing pains. You know, there's some areas on this team that are a little concerning. I think they will play hard for McGuire. You know, uh, one other thing to note last year is they made a boatload of field goals. Mm -hmm. Like, like I'm not saying, and and like that What's guy's the significance gone. There, just curious. Just like the the, the kicker. I, I just himself? think it. I think like kicker quarterback really matter in close game situations, and uh, they were third in the nation in points added over expectation for field goals. So. I mean, 49 out of 50 on PATs, four out of five on field goals, 45 plus. Uh, didn't they hit a really, really long one to beat Iowa State? Yeah, it's, I can't remember. Might not have been Iowa State, but I do remember they had a very long one to walk off somebody. Uh, perfect inside of 40 yards. 
It's nice Last to have a good year. kicker. He's gone though. Yeah, but you know, he taught the new guy. All right. He gave him his leg. Yeah, you can't. You're not talking me down off the Texas Tech train. Let's go. I, Guns up. Tortillas. This is okay. Like alternate, real quick, because I know I know everybody's got to go. Are we out of teams? Real more to go. No, we're good. We're out. All right. What would you do if it was five and a half? Because I think Caesars is the low man on this team. Like, there's definitely some. There's five and a half and some six out there. Like five is is the low number. Over. Interesting. I think I would. I think that's where I would split and go under. I wouldn't be as confident in the over, but I'd still be over. Okay. But I just yeah, like you're saying, I, at at five, I don't see this team going four and eight. So I feel like I'm kind I, of on a free roll. Yeah, that's that's what the um, at five and a half, I would not be. At five and a half, I would not rush to it, but four four and eight just doesn't seem likely. There's just too much. There's a, there's too much in place that I think would be able to help them out in that situation. They were freaking. They were a ball team last year. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to take a major step back. We'll see. You can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernell. You can follow him at Bud Elliott three. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. We will be continue our win totals next week with a focus on the ACC. The next week we come back with the Big Ten. Then it's the SEC, and then basically the season's here. So we are locked and loaded. The Cover Three Podcast is where you need to be for all of your college football season preparation. Subscribe, like us. Hit that YouTube channel and the bell so you get notifications every single time that there is a new video. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.